welcome to today's ODI Lunchtime Lecture, hashtag ODI Fridays. As always, we are live streaming, so if you have any questions, please do use the hashtag ODI Fridays. We pass around a microphone, it won't make any noise, but it's so people at home can hear. I'm going to give you a little warning that there probably will be some swearing today, and I'd like to introduce our head of policy, Mr. Peter K. Wells. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, hi, Bon. Uh, welcome to ODI Fridays. Uh, this is a talk about swearing. I've not done this talk before, so I might go fast, I might go slow, shout out if I'm going wrong. There'll be some swear words on the screen, and I'll say some swear words. Feel free to swear along and shout out the words you see, your favourite ones, or the ones you offend. So, you know, so this talk will contain language that will offend some people, including my mum, who I'm going to apologise to, as I regularly do. Uh, this is open your fucking data. This is open your fucking data. This is really what we need. I mean, it's one of those things. And if you're then offended by strong language, this is a clip from the Metro, actually. You, know, you might as well piss off right now because <laughs> there's a lot of them in this. So I'm very sorry, but these things are said in some circles. We have to understand them. And nope, swear words, they are data, really, when you start to look at it. Anyway, the story starts, like many stories, the story starts once upon a time. You know, I saw a 126 page PDF with lots of beautiful data inside it. And I'm looking out at some faces here, and I hear people got thinking bollocks. <laughs> you know? <coughs> really? 126-page PDF with data? No, the PDF contains swear words buried in that PDF. Now, often there's lots of PDFs with lots of data buried in them. There's actually a team up at, uh, just a quick shout-out, at ODI Leeds at the moment, who does some work with Adobe, looking at how to get data out of PDFs a bit better. But, you know, in this case, it didn't have it. So what I had to do when I saw the swear words in the PDF. I copied them out, stuck them into one of our tools, Octopub, and published them as open data. You know, because that's kind of what you do when you see some beautiful data. You want to get it open, you want to make sure you can get that data used. The, unfortunately, I made a mistake, I built a bad road. You know, data is like roads, that's what we do like to say, and I have to shoehorn that into every single talk so I can make more people remember that data is like roads. It's the closest analogy we have. But I built a bad road, one that had accidents, because I published the data, I stuck it out on Twitter, that's what I do. Uh, I sent it through to the people who published it. It was Ofcom and Ipsos and Murray. In Ipsos and Murray, the opinion research people who prepared this data about offensive swear words. The, somebody on Twitter pointed out to me I had the wrong licence on my data. Now, that's what Twitter's for, correcting open data licences. So I got that feedback quite quickly. You know, was I using the wrong licence? Was I allowed to republish the data? Ofcom and Ipsos and Murray, they pointed out a bit more wrong though, about the data, that there was, I was missing the context in the data, I just pushed out the words as data, just pushed out a list of swear words. And actually, context was really important. So the research they were doing, you know, people hope you correct things when you get things out there, that's why you do that. That data needs context. But this, this particular work, what it was, was, was some work Ofcom had commissioned from Ipsos and Murray in their role, you know, to say, what are offensive swear words? How offensive are different things? And actually, lots of the responses that came back from the focus groups and things they did was that context mattered about swearing. Words have different events in different places. So I was like, okay, I need to rejig my data and make sure I think about the context and how to do that. So I was talking with the team, you know, because this is kind of vital data we wanted to get out there. So we were quite keen to get that data out there. But one of the things we looked at was uh, some stuff done by prescribing data. Ben Goldacre, Anna Powell Smith over in Oxford, who put a context warning on some data they put out there about medical prescriptions. So really some similar context around the swear words. So here's how you could use the data if you're going to use it. Put some warnings around it. We don't want people saying bollocks all the time. We want to say bollocks when it's appropriate to say bollocks, basically. So or to know it's offensive. The <laughs> so the data, you can find it. Anybody out there? Just tiny.cc, lots of swears. <laughs> that will <laughs> take you to that data prepared by Ofcom and it's with a list of swear words. Type it in any time you need a swear word. The, obviously, you know, so I was looking at that and going, right, this is a bollocks. Here's some of the context for bollocks. It's a general swear word about body parts. It's medium offensiveness of language. Potentially unacceptable pre-watershed, that old TV thing about you know, nine o'clock on the watershed when kids go to bed. Not generally offensive. It is somewhat vulgar when used to refer to testicles. Less offensive when used to mean nonsense, as a politician tried at the weekend in using bollocks. It's also not amongst the least recognised words. Lots of us know that word. We know what it is, we know what it means, we know its context. So at that point, I'm going, great, this is fantastic. You know, we're ready to fucking use some swear word data. 
because that's really what it's about, getting the data used. You know? But I was quite happy. It's part of our mission, getting data to people who need it. I had a little tick in my box. You know, that endorphin rush you get when I say I've done part of my job for the day. But then I start to think, what are people going to use? You know, what are the needs around swear word data? What are people going to use it for? Because you know, I can publish it, get it out there, but I'm trying to look, listen and see what people are going to use it for. So that's why I was sticking out there and seeing the reactions I got back. I was getting quite a few reactions back on Twitter and elsewhere about the swear word data. The, we use data for swearing, swear words for swearing. That's pretty much what we'd all do. Does anyone in the room want to shout out their favourite swear word? <laughs> Embarrassed giggles. <laughs> Surely Something. some... So just shout out one. Fuck sticks. There we go, we have fuck sticks here. <laughs> The, I'm not sure if that's in the list, actually. Somebody might want to check and see if it's in there. It's collaborative documents, so it's in GitHub. Feel free to add it to the list if you want. The, just make sure you mark it as it didn't come from the Ofcom list so we don't get mixed up with the context. The, some of the ones that I was writing down are snob, balls, bastard. Feel free to shout out the words on the screen. Yeah, this is a swear along talk. <laughs> so, you know, let's think about our inhibitions. <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> the, no, and you do this, and I was looking around for some uh, academic research, because again, that's what I do sometimes. Now, why do people swear? And this is our, there's lots of links, by the way, at the end of this presentation, if anyone who wants it. But the, the main purpose of swearing is to express emotions, especially anger and frustration. And I think that was kind of why my community of open data people are looking at they, We feel quite a bit of frustration, so occasionally we might swear a bit about things that we see because we're trying to get that data out there. It can be frustrating sometimes. The other people, broadcasters use swear words to do their job. You know, they, sh they might shout bollocks as well. You know, they need to, that, but broadcasters also use it to understand what their presenters are allowed to say and when, and to understand their limits around what they can do. So lots of the broadcasters in the UK, they'll have their list of swear words, things they find offensive or not with their brand. And that Ofcom research actually informs them. It helps them understand what's appropriate, what's not. The, then there's a question kind of crossing my mind about how did we decide the words that should be in that offensive word list? Anyone any ideas? Surveys? surveys? I was wondering at one point, if I did speculate at one point before I'd actually read all the documents, maybe just like went down the train station and shouted out words and looked at who flinched or not. What's the proportion of flinching for that word? Complaints data. Complaints, Complaints data? data. Yeah. And that'd be a good one. The, what they actually did was use the research. So lots of focus groups. They selected groups of people from different backgrounds, different contexts, different cultures, different ages as well, and tested lots of words with them. So again, because that context bit around swearing is quite important. So they did that kind of classic user research. It just came out in a 128-page PDF. The, there's another part of it as well, how we decided. That's democracy. Because, you know, we've given a, created a regulator. We've given that regulator Ofcom a purpose. And we said your purpose is to further the interests of citizens and consumers. Now, they're saying part of the interest of citizens and consumers is not having swear words or very, very offensive things said before the watershed, which is broadcast out to an audience of 60 million who might see it through their TVs without realising. That's a very broadcast medium, so that's why they did that. The, so regulators use swear words through their job too, so they know when to get the PIN code on to say, this is something that needs parental control around it. That's, we've decided through our democratic system that is part of their job. Uh, I did a quick search beforehand as well. Legislation.gov.uk, you know how many regulations and laws there are about Ofcom. There's over 200 hits on there. When you look at those things being debated through Parliament and passed through to work out their role, and there's their role to regulate. That's very much the democratic system trying to meet our needs by understanding that. That's how they've interpreted it. Rightly or wrongly, that's democracy. It can change. The other people might use swear with data of a data driven censorship. This is Mary Whitehouse for those who are younger than me. <laughs> Slightly before my time too, I will say and stress. So Mary Whitehouse led a lot of campaigns to get offensive words off television and out of the newspapers. She was writing to these things. She was launched an entire group of civil society and you know, NGOs would think about it nowadays 
so, sorry, not an NGO, but a whole civil society campaign group to try and stop some of these things. Censorship by data like that can go wrong. Uh, bed knobs and broomsticks. Knobs get picked up quite quickly, you know? So that's going to get worried. And then, it's a Disney film for those who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, did see the I did see the confusion. This is the challenge of context and the world we live in and multicultural stuff. It's great. The challenges are fantastic. The, it's not just on TV. This is ginger nuts. And ginger is in the offensive words list because some people use it as an insult against people because of the colour of their hair. The, so would ginger, if I were just to do some very simplistic data-driven censorship, but this is mm nuts would be in trouble on a lot of shelves around the UK. So that would be a bad thing, that would be a bit silly. That's kind of the thing where you have to look at data, look at its context, work out how to use it, not just simplistic data-driven things. Because that's all. But there's a thing there as well, another bit, which is the context. So Ofcom's role is about broadcasting. So we're doing research about TV and radio. And when they're talking to people, they were saying, how would you find these things offensive if they came out of your TV set or your radio set, no, or your TV or radio set. It wasn't about if they saw a packet of ginger nuts in the supermarket aisle, because we get that context, that's a different thing. So we tend not to get offended at that. It's when somebody's using it as an offensive term. So that's kind of got me wondering though, because obviously, you know, I'm trying to solve problems at scale, I want swear word data, I want swear word data for my different things. So I got worried and I was like, all right, we need a big list of swear word data. I need to find a bigger list of swear word data and can start combining these things together. So I send out messages to various friends and people around the world and say, who's got a list of swear words? Have you got anything offensive you can throw at me, they said. And they gave me offensive stuff. Me, mostly. The, one of the things we came across was a list of suppressed car registration plates. So again... Feel free to shout out words. I know some people get embarrassed with these things. <laughs> we had a twat in from, you know, from the audience there. But, the <laughs> <laughs> but it's a huge long list. It's a 40, 40, this is a 44-page PDF, which you'll find if you do some digging around, uh, which has been reported on by the press again. They made some funny stories out of it. But it's a list of suppressed car registration plates. This is for the UK. It's the DVLA look after. So the Driving Vehicles Licence Agency. When you look at that list, you get some interesting ones. BMP, the UVF, Ulster Volunteer Force, UDA, and so forth, UFF, Ulster Freedom Fighters. So going here into that, some, actually some you know, terrorist organisations to some extent, I think, is what they'd be called, termed as in Northern Ireland. But you know, they're part of that political struggle over there in Northern Ireland, which is a very challenging thing, which I don't understand. I'm not from there, I've not lived there, I don't really understand. But these things are banned, and those words are banned on registration plates. IRA is also banned because of the letter I. You don't need to make an exception for it, but the letter I in there gets confused with a one. The, but again, a decision was made to ban those. One of those, particularly interesting, I mean, I find the BNP offensive, but they are a registered political party, the British National Party, they're far right. But they are a registered political party, but their car registration plate would be, has been decided that we'll suppress that. That's interesting, you know, how that was made. So I kind of, that kind of gets, I start to decide, you, know, you wonder how do we decide what should be suppressed on car registration plates. Interestingly as well, that data isn't, you know, DVLA do not publish that list. I couldn't find anything about it. I was doing lots of searching. All I can find is links to it from FOI requests, you know, which might kind of makes me and others what I want to say, actually, you know, DVLA, open your effing data. Because, you know, I should know what's going on there. I should understand a bit about that system. Again, maybe there's something interesting in there. The another list that comes up quite quickly is unparliamentary language. So language, if you use it in the House of Commons, if political representatives in the UK are talking to each other in the chamber, um, some of the words that have been banned, are, you know, have been, people have been warned for, bastard, blackguard, coward, deceptive has been defined as unparliamentary language. That's wrong to use in that context is the decision that's been made for all the different years. The, in some cases, some words are accepted in some contexts, not in others. It depends on the debate. The, there's a list out there if you do some searching and know the right people as well. Unparliamentary language in Australia. 
suck holing was one of my favourite. Uh, it took me a while to work out what that particular one meant. It's about creeping up to somebody. It's like cozying up a bit too much to somebody. Lieber, that was used in the debate, and that was deemed unparliamentary in that debate. So that was one that's out there. There's a guy in, over in, America, over in Australia who has got a database you can analyse all these things and look for. It's quite hard to find, but you can dig in. <coughs> the, so obviously, I created that as a list. Stuck it out there. Tiny <laughs> CC parliamentary swears. So any politician who's in there writing their speech, they can have a quick look and say what they're going to get told off for. They yeah, like to help politicians too. It's good because they're, they're democracy. The, but again, it's not to say how do we decide what is on parliamentary language? How has that evolved over the years? And there's quite an opaque system there. There's actually some complaints as in the UK, Hansa, they used to publish a list of unparliamentary language. They stopped doing that a few years ago. So some politicians complain, say, I don't know what I'm going to get away with or not. I don't know what I'm going to get told for. for. I, don't know what I'm going to, I don't know what list of words I might say to deliberately cause a scene. Maybe people would use that to deliberately get banned if that list was there. I don't know if that's the motivation, but it's quite unclear. The, another list we came across is a, a data set called Hate Base. Which is looked after by a team, somebody down in Cambridge I came across. Mm. It's got a list of hate speech from across the world. From across the world, it's collaboratively maintained. So lots of people saying these are words that are used for hate. You can look in there and you can see kind of the words around some of the massacres in places like Rwanda. The, and the words that were used in there to drive people and motivate people to hate other people. And again, that's a very complex and technical thing, and it's from across the world, lots of different communities and people working together say, I'm seeing these things. I suppose one of the interesting things there, again, if that data, that data's out there, it's used, very usable. The, but if that was combined with other things, you might be able to, I don't know, look at trends on hate speech on the rise on the fall in different nations. That might let us know if another massacre's on the way. So that would be an interesting thing for someone to do. The, but again, how do we decide what hate speech is? Again, that usage and terminology changes over time. I think it was a shibboleth, for example, you see in the Bible, as a word that was used to spot other people and find out if somebody was from a race that people wanted to kill because they, they pronounced it differently. That was one of the tells people used. The, so I suppose the moral of all that is that at that point, it's context is a very complex six-letter word. The, and when you do some searching, you find, you know, I'm a data geek, but this is a philosopher talking about this problem because there's philosophers of swearing. This is a swearing philosopher. Fantastic. The, I want their business card. The, you know, so the people have looked into these problems and all that context to understand what's going on and how that works. The, you can see in here, here's an example about football matches. Using Dan, where Dan is less likely to cause offence today than it was several decades ago. So time has changed the offensiveness of words because cultures have changed. The, here's another example. So there's one for, I'm a fan of Blackpool Football Club. This man here, <coughs> Carl Oyston, is the current chairman of Blackpool Football Club. Now, he called a fan a retard, told him to enjoy his special needs day out. He got fined and banned and got fined for it. He's offended me and thousands of Blackpool fans by taking legal action and threatening legal action against lots of people by transferring money from the football club elsewhere. So the word Oyston is actually an offensive word in Blackpool to many people. That word has become offensive. He actually had a car at one point. The, so he got a car registration at one of the protests, which said on it, the car registration it was riffing on the phrase we had used, oyster out. It wasn't a suppressed car registration plate, but it was offensive to us and to my community. So we found it offensive. So some people decided they'd write knob, shit, house, dick, and fuck off on his car as a response to his car registration play, as a response to what he'd done to his community, how offensive he'd been to us. So offensive, it changes over time. It can be local to a community. Another example there. Does anyone know who this fellow is? Rick Santorum. Rick Santorum, who said some th offensive things about homosexuality. So a columnist called Dan Savage decided he would create a neologism, neologism, a new word, he would define Santorum to mean something offensive, something that would offend mm -hmm. Santorum. And he could find it a frothy mixture of lube and fecal matter, sometimes the byproduct of anal sex. And they got the name to Google, they got into all the search engines. That was what you found, you search for Santorum, you find that. 
that is the definition of the word. That's what they've created it. They've made the word offensive. They've made his surname offensive. So again, that's what people can do. We've got interesting powers. We change things over time. You know, people game systems. So one of the ideas we had there, uh, this is a quick thing I ch shoddily knocked up on a t-shirt site but didn't order, of, I put a code on it. That code is actually the unique ID of a swear word in the swear word list that I published from Ofcom. So you could print that on a t-shirt. You know, if you're going to ban some of those swear words, that particular one, offensive term, was beef curtains. <laughs> the, so if beef curtains was banned, if people would say we're going to ban that on the internet, people would work around it. You'd, you'd start to say the number instead. You'd, call, you'd say to someone, B1F5, they go, oh, how dare you, slap. You've offended my honor. The, you could print it on t-shirts. So things evolve and change over time. And people game systems, we work around things. I'll just wait one second. The you know, people adapt, so it goes. That's what happens, we adapt, we do things, we change. We adapt to systems and things that try to block us or stop us doing things we want to do. Swear out of anger and frustration. Now, people is a more complex, lesser word than context. It's one of those things that we often forget. We forget our complexity, our beautiful complexity. The, when I talk about this, somebody goes, ah, this is easy, though. Machine learning. I could build a machine that would, and teach a machine that would learn swear words <coughs> and offensiveness. Exactly, that. it's machine learning. You know, here's a machine that learns. It's a smartphone. Our smartphones learn because the system's behind them. We've got lots of... <laughs> the, it's the first result for a smartphone, Creative Commons. The, well, that's of course what it is. The, uh, you know, smartphones, there's lots of technology in there, lots of the tools and apps inside those smartphones. They learn as they go. They're learning. There are machine learning algorithms in there already. It's not nothing new. It's already there in our lives. So how will that machine, if I get a machine, how would I get the machine to decide and learn what's offensive? I found a patent by Google the, called the classification of offensive words about machine learning to uh, work out what's offensive. So I've already patented a methodology for doing this. So if you do some searching, you can find some of the people are thinking about this. Obviously, it's a logical thing you find when you go down it. Therefore, if you're a big company, you can invest in some research, patent it to try and capitalize on the money, and to try and build something, maybe sell it as a service. Offensive word spotting as a service coming to an app store near you very soon. The, unfortunately, it's crap. The, it completely missed the context bit. It's just working from a set of text samples. You know, how is a set of text samples going to convey the context and the rich context about me making Oyston a swear word in Blackpool? Rick Santorum. The context of... The, you know, the different words that mean different things to different people and different cultures all around the world within different contexts. Saying something to me in front of my mum might be more offensive to me than saying it to me in front of, in front of me, to me in a pub with a group of friends. That context matters, where I am, who I'm with. The, so yeah, it's crap pattern. The, but, you know, all good fun. It was always nice to fill in patent forms. I'm sure somebody got a bonus. But you know, then you go, well, maybe people can help the machines. You know, like most machine learning things, machines do not make decisions, people make decisions. We train machines, we choose to use machine learning algorithms. It's the people that are driving it. So if we can help that, build a better machine learning algorithm using people. And when you do that, you find actually Google already do that. They've got some around about 10,000 people helping their algorithms learn around the world. I'm calling it decentralized user research. Let's see if that catches on. The They've got people already that they're out there, they give them tasks to do to check, is this service working? How would you respond? How would you expect this service to respond? Most of the people don't work for Google. It'd be similar with the other big companies as well, machine learning and AI and all those training algorithms and big services. They've just outsourced it to somebody else around the world, various different locations, and they allocate them tasks and say, check, how would you expect this to work? So there's a bit to a, a link to an article talking about some of the changes going on there. You can imagine a task, so I was trying to think, what task would you do if you wanted to get that to uh, understand offensiveness? You, know, you might say to one, go to a football ground in Gdansk, play this video to the crowd, wait a week, see how they re respond to you, to each other, see if you're still alive after a week, depending on what the video is, and then feed back on the offensiveness. That's a really complex 
contextual thing around these things. You're never going to try and solve all of it. No. And then you get to how are the organisations who decide to use the machines decide what is offensive? You know, why is it, should Google be deciding what's offensive? Should that be a regulatory thing? Like Google, for our, defined for our democratic system? That's one of the process, things in one of the manifestos this week was talking about making the online world like the offline world and banning some offensive content on the internet. How would that happen? How would we decide? How would we work out that list? How, would that, how could we ever enforce that if it wasn't aware of context? The context of something on the internet that I'm viewing for a smartphone screen maybe is very different to the content blaring out from a TV in homes around the country, which is where Ofcom have come from. They're very different contexts. <coughs> And at this point, like many of my things and many of my long tails, I find myself down a very big rabbit hole. Because you know, these are the things, but these are things you find when you think about what's the impact of my data, and you start to think about the ethical questions that are posed by just publishing data, because often that's what we think about impact. No matter if it's personal data or non-personal data, it's still ethical questions about that impact. So I started to pull myself up. So I just said to myself, bollocks, Peter. You're kind of, you're waffling on again. You're just going to carry on, do silly things. As ever, complex problems are tackled by starting small. We just bite these things off. That's what we do. That's how we know how to build technology, how we know how to build things that work. The, it's quite simple, really. Swear words are data. I could find that, I could use that. That data can be open. I proved that. I actually asked Ofcom and Ipsos Mori if they minded me publishing it under an open license. They're very happy. So, OK, of course. We didn't even think that would be useful to anybody. So, yeah, feel free. Just make sure you do the context. So I just politely asked. That data is going to meet some needs. In this case, it's actually helping people understand what Ofcom and what the people they interviewed, what they defined as, what they worked out as being offensive and how offensive it is and where and how, and who to, in some cases. It's, really, it's a really, really interesting, <coughs> excuse me, really, really interesting report. The, the context, that context is important and complex, and people are far more important and far more complex than context. The, the other thing I suppose I learned from this is people, organisations, communities and societies making decisions about what is offensive, all these different layers. That's a complex world we live in. We're all working together to make decisions about what's offensive at various different times. Each of you in the room, as you've been choosing whether or not to say a swear word, you've been thinking about that offensiveness and what it means to you. The early slot community here. The big thing there is just that technology changes. These things change, but me publishing that data, people using it, will again change things. That will cause people to adapt by doing that if it was used heavily. If it isn't, who cares? I don't care. It took me 15 minutes. The, but technology changes, people adapt, so it goes. That's kind of the way of the world. P.S. So it's just closing now. You know, just start small and open your fucking data. It's really easy when you think about it, isn't it? Feel free to have a chorus of that. Actually, don't know what to chorus that. <laughs> but can't you win? See how brave we're thinking after talking about this? Three, <laughs> two, one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can do louder. <laughs> Three, two, one. Open your fucking data. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, Mum. <laughs> That's me. Oh. It's one thing, sorry, the other thing I have to do. Uh, so the other thing we did, so I can't get, quite get into the slides, but the, uh, one of my colleagues, Sam, we've got a, one of my ex-colleagues, Sam, obviously he turned into, it's data, it's data on the web. That means I can run it from my command line. That's what you can do with swear word data. You can make computers sing it all over the world. Shout when you've had enough. We can do it in different voices as well. We can change the accent. It's just built in. It's very simple. Anyway, the giggling is possibly getting too much now. And thank you. And I repeat, sorry, Mum. Perfect. Okay. Um, so we checked, and there's no questions so far on Twitter. So if you have a question, please do get it in using the hashtag ODI Fridays. Um, I'd like to open up to the room. Does anybody have a question for Peter? 
just pass you the microphone. So how much collaboration is there on lists of swear words? <coughs> how closely do Ofcom work with British Board of Film Classification? Do they work with DVLA on, on what's offensive on number plates today? I couldn't tell that. The, one, one of the things I found was uh, from, talking, from talking with various people who were in the industry is the big TV broadcasters, they actually have their own list of words. And they, so they don't collaborate and share that data together. They don't share each other their best practice. So they should, they'll probably share some of it anecdotally. But it's not shared as a collaborative data thing the way I would think of it. But it was interesting to see they had their own list. They didn't just rely on the Ofcom list. They had their own things. I believe within one of the big broadcasters in the UK, there is collaboration within their organisation around that particular list across different branches of it. And some of the words are never hotly debated. But yeah, other than that, not much. And not much between the different regulators. Any other questions in the room for Peter? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, You'll be familiar, no doubt, with Rogers. Is this working? I was just talking. Yeah, it's Ro the people at home. Oh, see. Rogers Profanosaurus and its yes. various editions, including, including the little Magna Fartlet, I think it's called, is a fantastic resource. But in terms of officially deciding what is a swear word and what is mere vernacular or colloquialism, yep. there's a fine line. So presumably the bottom line is the OED or other dictionaries. So, what I, so th that leads into my actual question, which is, is a sort of analysis in, in, the, in terms of swear words diversity of how they use all parts of speech? So I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was 16, I worked in a warehouse in Manchester, yep. and there was one particular character called Dave Flood, and he was a, a very uh, vernacular chap, <laughs> shall we say. And I remember a particular occasion where the forklift lift truck broke, and he uh, came out with a timeless utterance, Oh, fucking fuck. The fucking fuckers fucking fucked. <laughs> and if you analyse that sentence, you'll find that pretty much every part of speech is used by one single word. Yep. Uh, so that's He's getting across a lot of meaning. Of yeah. that, isn't it? So uh, at what point is the context there swearing or just use of parts of speech? It's dependent on the people there and their level of offence. I think that's just one of the things that comes out of things of research. It depends on the people there and their level of offence. And whether they're, I suppose their right to be offended or the their offensiveness they feel and how that imprints on them, how that affects on somebody else's right to express their anger and frustration at the fucking machine that did not fucking work. So these things come out from those different things. Yeah, I don't think you can actually define them in the OED because of that context point. So you know, words that are written are different offensive, lived in it's a word that's spoken within a different context and who it's spoken to and at and about. Good question. And it's a very good example. Starting to get some questions in on Twitter, but just a reminder to get these in on hashtag OGI Fridays. Are there any more questions in the room before we take those? Yes. Um, so James, I'll hand over to you first. I was in a meeting last week and used the word cunt to describe somebody I'd worked with, um, and then took it back. And after I'd taken it back, one of my colleagues chipped in and said, "Well, it's probably not strong enough." <coughs> um, and um, I, I told my other half about this, and and she said, "Oh, well, you know." You're a civil servant, you shouldn't be swearing. Swearing is lazy. Ooh. What do you think about that? I don't think swearing is lazy. I think it can be creative. I think new, I suspect some of the new words we have now, which are quite normal, start off as swear words. So we suddenly said it to express something they couldn't get out and it's just become normalised and part of our normal everyday speech. Language evolves and that's brilliant. So yeah, swearing, I don't think swearing is lazy. Swearing all the time might be lazy, <laughs> but there's moments when we have to express that anger or frustration. I'm very polite and I do swear but barely. Yeah, I think I have a question over here. Yeah, I'll just come around to you. Do you see any limits to uh, the opening of this data? So uh, whether it's from Parliament and encouraging people to be offensive in Parliament or whether <laughs> it's uh, mass killings in Rwanda and encouraging people to hate people, do you see any limits? Yeah. So I definitely see an ethical. I definitely see some ethics around it, and there's some some risks and impact. You know, if the if we were to make this data open, if we were to build a bigger, better list of swear words, which contained all the swear words and context, and people were to use it to, for censorship, and that might be that's a use that might make me say, I, I don't want that to happen. That's a bad use. If I can't stop the censorship, I might have to withdraw the data. The you know, so data can be used for bad person if that. The, huge, the impact of that is outweighing the good it can do, then there are some circumstances where we might have to withdraw things. It's a, it's a challenging thing. That's where 
There's a data ethics debate, which is going on. It's quite rife and it's good. It's rife and the things we're learning from other sectors about data, in the data sector is learning from other sectors about ethics. It's quite an important one because we've created new things and we're not quite sure of all those impacts yet. But there will be limits. I'll take the question line in a moment. Are there any more questions in the room? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, loads of hands. Okay, I'll start with you, sir. Just a quick question in terms of what you've done so far. Is it possible to sort of compile a top 10 list of, you know, offensive words in the UK and maybe even compare it in generational terms and then to, to see how uh, things develop? And I think, like, would, uh, can you say more on uh, how Ofcom define offensive words? Because is it just one person being offended, a group or a hundred, or what is it? So it was, uh, for Ofcom it was a group. So they took in a list of, I think it was 144 words they originally identified. 144 words and phrases, something like that. And they took them in with focus groups. So they asked the groups of people and those, those groups of people to help them understand how offensive it was. And they allowed those groups to define the offensiveness based on their reactions and different, different things. And those groups were quite mixed as well, with different backgrounds, which is good. I haven't dug out the historical list to look at those trends in time. That's something I would love to do, but Unfortunately, my full-time job stops my whimsy sometimes. <laughs> the, I can only go so far down my rabbit holes. Um, I take the point about sort of uh, adaptation and the importance of context, but did you find any universalities across things that are practically always offensive in different cultures? I mean, maybe I haven't read enough hundred page documents on swears, but it seems, <laughs> it seems that in things you know, that are particularly sexual in nature across many cultures are uh, offensive. So is there anything universal about it? Yes, yeah, so, 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 I so I would expect there to be things around bodily parts and bodily functions, because again, as human beings, for some, most cultures have found themselves offended by some of those things at different points in time. Religion, as well, be something in you know, terms of religion used as abuse against other people, because that's come, you know, it's possibly come out from the hate speech and that kind of thing, but possibly softened over the years. But again, the way we've attacked and abused people. Fully universal? I don't think so. It's just those general themes. It's, uh, actually, it's one of the things I've been seeing as well in the AI world recently, people saying they can build universal language translators and things like that. There's, uh, there was actually Noam Chomsky, who's obviously known a lot more now for his political writing. He's a linguist. And one of his ideas was that there is a universal grammar, and it's generally not been found. It's been proved to kind of be in false. There are some tribes and groups of people who use different grammar, which has no relation to other grammars and other languages. Stop to go. Question around <sighs> here. What was that? Just excited hand? An excited hand. Okay, yep, I'm going to take over here. So, in the data that you've looked at so far, how much distinction has it drawn in terms of like, the purpose of the language? Because I'm the so two examples that I've seen here, there's like the swear words that you would use to make yourself feel about feel be better about something like the fucking fuck is not fucking working yeah. or whatever it might be. Uh, and then on the other side, you have the ones that are used to divide people and foster hatred. Yeah. Um, of the data you've seen, has that drawn that distinction? Or has it all been a big pile of, these are all bad words? It has drawn that distinction. So Ofcom categorised it into different things as well, things about bodily parts and things, in terms of abuse about religion, in terms of abuse about types of people. So m midget is in there as a swear word against some people because some people are using that as, a term of, as offensive to some people because some people are using it as a form of abuse against individuals. And some people would find that offensive in the wrong context. Uh, there's lots of things there. Uh, I'd have to go back and play the list again, <laughs> but there's lots in there around those different groups. Yeah, the terms of abuse are the ones I suppose that worried instinctively for me. They, they're the ones that worry me. They're the terms I would never use personally because they're, they're not in my thing. I would use the ones of exasperation, I suppose, around bodily parts. Thank you. That's a good question. Okay, we'll take questions online. Of course, we've got two questions. One from Tom Middleton who asks, uh, have there been any uses of your effing data yet? Uh, no, there was a... Somebody was going to build it into some school software, some school blogging software. I don't know if that's finished yet. But the, again, the challenge there was to make sure it wasn't, didn't turn into data-driven censorship. They wanted to use that as when small children, uh, primary school and, and uh, young adults are secondary, whatever the year groups are nowadays, was how to turn it into a moderation, part of a moderation system to give an indication to a teacher there might be something to watch out for there. But it can only ever be that might be because kids are creative with their insults. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Um, and one from Michael Shawnby, who asks, um, 
Did you encounter, encounter words that aren't swearing, just ignorance of language? No. I think one of the... No, th there was, it was actually interesting in talking about it with people, how many of the swear words that people didn't know were offensive to some other people. So when we're talking about them here and going around, saying to people, hey, let me talk to you about swear words, the, I did do it yesterday to the CEO of a slightly large organisation. Hey, I'm talking about swear words tomorrow. Let me yeah, see what you think. Uh, these are the fun conversations. How we start talking about data policy and ethics. The, <laughs> but there were words in there that people didn't realise were offensive. So chalk ice is one of the best, easiest examples there. So a chalk ice is that's nice for many people. It's an ice cream. It's a magnum. It's whatever it may be that I can eat and enjoy. But chalk ice is an offensive term when used in a community against somebody. You're accusing somebody of being black on the outside, white on the inside. And I was, just, I was surprised how many people that didn't know that term. And they didn't know that that term could be used as abuse in those contexts. That's a really complex contextual thing there. Okay, so we've got five minutes, so is there any more questions for Peter before the end? Yes. Peter, what do you hope Ofcon will learn from you opening their data? That next time they do this research, and they will do, they'll do it regularly, it's, it's, I say it's very good research, but they'll publish the research, both the words and the data. So publish the data alongside the words, make that accessible, get that used and listen to what people do with it or think about it, because I think that will help their future research when they start to see that how we're going there. I mean, Ofcom's purpose isn't just about TV and radio. So I think there's things there that our regulators need to learn about the internet, the web, the new challenges we're evolving as our societal norms evolve in those space. By getting the data out there, I think it'll help them understand that because they'll see that people like me and Sam might turn, make it to make computers say swear words. And that's not a bad thing, but it's just that use will happen. Any more final questions? Behind you. Yeah. Do you think you have a right not to be offended on the web? Um, so, you talked about the watershed and, and TV, yep. and there's sort of certain times you would not expect to hear certain things. How does that work on the web? I don't think I have a right not to be offended on the web. There are parts of the web that will offend me, there always will be. Some of those things that will offend me on the web will be political views that I agree, disagree with, and on nonsense, but might actually be fairly mainstream. If I look at it and go, that offends me. How can you do that? That's ridiculous. So, no, there's no right not to be offended. But there's a need to be an understanding of the <coughs> impact of that offence, how that would cause, how that's going kind to of things. I mean, there are. Again, everyone knows, I don't think everyone knows this, but there is a, you know, in the UK we have a, there's some various different blacklists around the web, but there's one which is looking at child pornography and saying these are sites that are known to contain child pornography and those are blocked in various different ways. So, you know, so we've worked out ways to say that we're going to curb some of the worst successes over here, but recognise there's this huge grey area and that some people will be offended and sometimes suck it up. Any final questions for Peter? Yeah. Just on that, um, around a year ago, I think, uh, I posted a tweet with a, a feminist hashtag and I got a lot of abuse for it. And remember, you said that Twitter aren't doing their job yeah. because I was receiving such abuse. Yeah. What, what should they be doing? I don't know. I don't know the solution. I mean, there's parts of it you can see is, for example, better tools to spot people actively harassing other people. You, know, you could see, so I saw that abuse going towards you and I clicked into the, the accounts that were sending that abuse and you could see them abusing lots and lots of other people. So what purpose do they have on the platform? Are they you know, the drunk coming into the pub swinging out everyone nearby? So there's, but there's tools that could spot the behaviour or could help you say, I want to block lots of people. I want to dampen down all of my feed right now while they calm down, because I don't want that abuse. The, yeah, I think filtering it by words. I've seen some stuff recently of, twi of Twitter filtering stuff by words, and that's that Google mistake. It misses all the context about how the word's being used. Any more questions? I think, I'm just gonna double check, I don't miss anybody. No, Peter, anything else? Nope. No, perfect, okay, great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank fuck it's Friday. Uh, enjoy <laughs> the rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.